I don't have any time left. I did my best to try and call everyone. I went to the police. They couldn't help. I know I didn't make this thing up in my head, and I'm not going crazy. There's still damage on my work truck from where it collided with me that night. There's no safe place left for me to hide at. I tried everything, but nothing worked. My cellar was the only place left that I could think to barricade myself in and wait this thing out. It hasn't stopped tracking me since last night. I know it's hunting me. I can still remember its face. Its disgusting, putrid face. I suppose I better use what time I have left in hiding to write this down, even though most people won't believe me. I work landscaping for a company up in East Texas, where I usually spend hours up near Nacogdoches clearing out trees and helping new homeowners level out their land for construction. I'm busy out there, driving on the roads through the trees and such for very long stretches of the day and having a long time driving back home to my house on the outskirts of Huntsville. I'm usually out driving for a few hours every day to different houses everywhere across that area. Taking odd jobs every now and again does help pay off what my job won't. I'm so used to the roads and highways there that I'm not afraid to drive at night like some people are. Over here, we have a lot of tall trees, but not a lot of people in between cities. It isn't uncommon to have to drive down one of these roads at night through the trees. People are afraid of deer being in the road, and there are a few who are paranoid of the Huntsville prison and the possibility of there being escaped inmates on the loose. I'm not afraid of either of those personally due to my old-fashioned work truck with an oversized grill guard. If I can't stop quickly enough in time for a deer, the truck and I will be okay. As for inmates, I've never seen anyone out in the trees at night aside from the few people who live in trailers or small houses along the highway and back roads. So when I got hit the other night, I thought something massive like a runaway wild animal from one of the reserves 50 miles away had hit me. I couldn't have been more mistaken. It was a Thursday night, and I was on my way back home to Huntsville and had to pass through the trees again. It was no big deal, at first. I passed by a couple of deer, one as I was heading away from the house I had been working on most of the day, and later one as the sky grew dark around me. I barely saw it before it ran in front of the road and had just enough time to barely graze by its fluffy tail. It was a 12 point buck and was enormous. I drove a little slower after that point as stars began to show in the night sky. Everything around me fell still for a while as I passed through the trees on my way home. After about 30 minutes, there came a loud and distinct but distant sound of wailing. At first, I thought it was some animal being attacked. Then I heard it again. It was the same sound, but it sounded much louder and closer. It bordered between sounding like a screech and a wail at this point, and it hurt my ears with its pitch. As I continued to drive along the road and speed up, I began to smell something like a mixture of sweet chemicals and a rotting corpse, like I was smelling rotting meat mixed with the aroma of a fresh marker. The smell was awful, it made me gag as I tried not to breathe it in. I turned on the air circulation filter in my car to block out the stench and held my nose for about 30 seconds. Once I had counted to 30, I took in a deep breath, and it seemed like the stench was gone. I thought that maybe a possum or a skunk had died and I was just passing by the dead body. If only I had stepped on the gas and drove faster. After about two minutes of thinking that I had passed whatever foul-smelling thing that was on the side of the road, my focus transitioned back to getting home. The stench had cleared just enough out of the forefront of my mind before I started to smell it again. And this time, the stench was back and much stronger. I had no idea what this thing was that I was smelling, but I had my air filter on in my car and the smell that was coming in through the vents was even stronger than before. Whatever this stench was coming from was getting closer and closer to my truck and it began to make me feel sick to my stomach. My vision was taken off the road for a brief second while I gagged, and that was all it took for me to barely miss what happened next. Right as my eye locked on the road, a large black figure dashed out of the trees and slammed into my car. The impact nearly tipped my truck off the road and it forced me to overcorrect my truck just to keep it from rolling. I ended up speeding off the road and braked just hard enough to prevent the truck from fully slamming into a tree. The front grill guard hit the tree but it didn't hit it hard enough for the airbag to be engaged. I decided to turn the truck around and get out to see what the damage looked like. I looked over the truck and saw a large dent along with two puncture holes in the passenger side door. They didn't manage to make it through the interior of the truck, but I knew that whatever hit me left a large enough dent that I wouldn't be able to perform a simple fix on it. The door smelled as bad as the outside air did before and made me gag as I inspected the door. 
There was a thick sludge on the truck that I was too reluctant to touch by hand, so I put on one of my work gloves to inspect the sludge that was on the side of the truck. As I inspected the passenger side door, I didn't realize that whatever it was that hit me was standing on the road about 10 yards away from me. I was shocked by what I saw. I noticed that the stench on the side of the door and outside had started to fade. Instead, I started to smell a strong and fragrant scent. The air started to smell like lavender and sweet-smelling flowers. I stared at the figure out on the road for what felt like a moment, trying to figure out what it was. The sludge and marks left on the truck matched the color of the figure on the road. The figure is about my height, somewhere near being six feet tall, and was breathing heavily. The body was shaped like a human, but it was covered in a thick, dark sludge. The headlights of my truck illuminated the figure's body. The sludge that was on the side of the truck covered this figure, almost as if it was caked in it, or like it was part of him. I called out to the figure, thinking that maybe it was someone covered in this nasty sludge that happened to slam into my truck and needed my help. With the dizzying smells that kept assaulting my nostrils, I didn't know what to really think. Hey there, buddy. You need some help? The figure opened its eyes for the first time, showing two soulless white eyes that stared intently at me. The figure tilted its head like a dog, studying me with its long, cold gaze as it tried to figure out exactly what I was. All I heard afterward was the figure saying through a low and gargled tone was the word toxin. I called out to it again. Is there something wrong? Do you need to get to a- And before I could finish the word or take another step towards it, it started screeching at me. I immediately started to panic and ran towards the driver's side of the door as this ear-piercing wail terrified me. I'd never heard a being make something this hideous sounding. I immediately put the truck back in the driving gear and began to race off down the road. I remember seeing the figure leap at the back end of the truck, desperately clinging on to the tailgate and trying to hold on before it lost its grip when I took a sharp turn and flung it off into the trees. I sped my way back home, not thinking for a second to try and call for help or to stick around and figure out what that thing was. I got home and immediately locked up all the doors and windows and sent a call out to my employer, letting them know that I had been hit by some sort of animal and the truck was damaged. They were none too happy about one of their work vehicles being damaged, but there wasn't much I could do about that. The next day, I rode down that road again back to the site in my co-worker's work truck while mine was in the repair shop. I tagged along with my friend and co-worker Jose to help me with clearing out some of the dead trees. I told him about what happened last night, and he couldn't believe me. Wes, I think you lost it. There's no way that crap happened. Why didn't you just tell the boss you got hit by a deer or something? I tried to reason with him, but it didn't appear that telling him the truth was working. Look, I told the boss an animal hit it, but I didn't specify what kind. I'm not worried about how the company files it with the insurance. I'm worried about what the truck hit, man. What do you think it was? Jose finished digging out the stump before he started talking again. He took a deep breath before he explained his doubts. <sighs> Honestly, I have no clue what that thing could be, man. It looked like a guy covered in some crap or something, right? Sludge is what you said it was, am I right? And yeah, what are you getting at? Well, I think it was an inmate or something from Huntsville who covered himself in dog shit and ran into your truck thinking he could get a ride. He started laughing at his own joke. All the while, I was trying to get him to take me seriously. Cut the crap, Jose. I'm serious. I've got no clue what that damn thing was, but it attacked the truck, my truck, and then started screaming at me when I tried to ask it if it needed help. He laughed some more. Maybe the boogeyman can tuck you in tonight. He should be able to keep you safe from Stinky McGee who keeps running around in the woods tackling trucks. He finished laughing and stabbed his shovel into the earth to finish his thoughts when he saw that I still had a serious expression on my face. Look, man. I don't know what to tell you. I wish I could help you out with this, but I got no clue what you're dealing with. Have you tried calling the sheriff's office about this thing? I shook my head. I doubt they'll listen. There's nothing to do around here and nothing happens. I won't show up for anything short of murder. There's no point in even trying to get them involved. Jose wiped the swarm of fire ants that were trying to climb up his work boots and pants. Well, I don't have any better ideas. If I come up with some of them after I finish digging these trees out and finish getting eaten alive by these damn fire ants, I'll let you know. We both chuckled at that and went back to finishing up our work for the day. After a few hours went by and we had finished packing up our supplies for the day, Jose took us driving on the road back to Huntsville. The road was quiet, being illuminated by only the truck headlights and the somewhat stronger light of the full moon cascading its light down as I weaved my way along the road through the forests. We continued on for a little while, talking about what we would have for dinner once we got back into town. That didn't last long before the stench. 
The same one from the night before hit us both. I immediately turned on the air filter for the truck. Jose started to joke about the smell, trying to play it off. Damn, Wes! Something nasty must have died back there! My mind was too focused on trying to get out of there. Jose, start speeding up. Now. He was laughing even more now. Take it easy, Wes. It was probably just a skunk or something. I grew worried as I told Jose to speed up again. Jose, speed up. Now. That same stench is what I smelled last night before my truck got hit. Drive faster, please. He started to speed up the truck. All right, Wes, I'll drive a bit faster, but you need to stop acting so crazy. Right as he finished that statement, the smell became almost unbearable. And then, I heard it. The same ear-piercing scream came about half a mile up ahead of us. It was too late. We were heading straight into an ambush. I tried to get Jose to speed up, but he was too slow to react. Wes, what the hell is that? Right then, the same black figure sprung out from the trees and slammed into the passenger side, causing the truck to swerve off the road and forced Jose's side to scrape into a tree, knocking off the side mirror and forcing the trucks to engage their safety airbags. I was disoriented for a moment, looking on in Jose's direction as my vision and senses came back into full clarity. I shot up as I saw a now terrified Jose being grabbed by his right shoulder and dragged out through the broken driver's window by the figure. That disgusting creature ran off with my friend, dragging him through the forest, his blood-curdling screams vibrating through the forest as he ran off with him, the fear in his throat at a fever pitch. I became overwhelmed with terror and frantically tried to reach for my phone. I started to dial the number to call my boss before I stopped hearing Jose's screams and cries for help. I slowly got out of the truck and tried to quietly close the passenger side door as I did. As soon as the door clicked in place, I heard a noise that will haunt me for as long as I live. The most painful scream I'd ever heard, followed by a loud, bone-crunching noise. Whatever that thing did to Jose, he was now dead, and judging by the horrible stench starting to return, I was next. I got into the driver's seat and tore the airbag from the steering wheel and threw it into the passenger seat. I floored the gas pedal and raced off in Jose's work truck back to Huntsville. I got home with Jose's truck, ran inside my house and locked up all the doors and double-checked to make sure the windows were still locked from yesterday. I phoned up my boss immediately to see if he would answer. I got no response. He was already fast asleep and I was helpless. I made a desperate call to the sheriff's office hoping that someone there would pick up. The deputy answered the phone. Yes, what seems to be the problem? I tried to explain everything that had happened, doing my best to control my fear in my throat. The deputy seemed to be scared of what I was telling him. He did his best to try and help ensure my safety. Do you have any place in your home where you can barricade yourself? I thought for a moment, and then I remembered the old cellar. This house was originally my grandfather's. He had built a cellar that had two entrances in. One was on the outside, and one was on the inside of the house. Yeah, I have a cellar I can barricade myself in. The deputy seemed pleased with this plan. Good. Get a jug of water and some food and head down there with any guns or knives you've got and barricade yourself in. I'll head out right now and check out your house. I gave him the street address and my phone number so he could call me back if he got lost. I'll be over in about 10 minutes. In the meantime, barricade yourself in and try not to lose your head. The deputy hung up the phone and I went to grab the apples I had on my table and some bread and jug of water I had near the fridge and rushed into the cellar. I sat them down and went upstairs to grab my shotgun and a large bowie knife I used for hunting. I ran down into the cellar and set those down. I then went to grab a pen and some paper so I could have something to write all of this down on because as much as I want to make it out of this alive, I don't know if I will right now. The deputy arrived about two minutes after I finished setting up boards and storage units at both entrances. He made his way to the outside one and began to knock on it. Hey, are you in there, Wesley? I went over to the entrance. Yeah, I'm here. Is it safe outside? The deputy tried his best to calm the fear that I held. I heard him pull his gun out from his holster. That's what I'm here to try and find out. You sit tight in there while I take a look around the property to see if this thing followed you back here. He started to look around the house, commenting on the stench that began to permeate the air again. I began to panic. Sir, I think it's here. Are you okay? The deputy began to cough and covered his mouth so he could talk. What the hell is this thing? The air stayed silent for what felt like minutes, but lasted mere seconds. I counted as the time went by. I barely got to 30 seconds before I started to hear the same wailing I heard earlier in the forest. I heard the deputy begin to panic. What the hell is that thing? He began to start screaming into his radio. I need backup! Calling all backup! 
He started to say what code for the situation it was and tried to send out my address before I started hearing gunshots being fired. I couldn't make out what he was saying until he stopped firing his gun. A minute later, I began to hear him screaming. Let me in! Wesley! Let me in! His screams for help grew louder as he pounded on the metal door to the cellar until I heard his bones shatter. His screams turned into gargling as I heard his bones be crushed by that thing that had been hunting me. I grew sick but covered my mouth as I began to hear the being rip the deputy's body apart and begin to feast on it. After a while, everything fell silent. This is when I started to write all of this out. It's been quite some time since I've heard anything outside, that thing, or the police. I'm not sure what this thing is, and honestly all I can call it is what it said the first night I met it. A toxin. This thing, whatever the hell it is, is a toxin and is a ruthless beast that hunts, kills, and eats people. I don't know if I'll survive tonight, but if I don't, at least there will be this story and what remains of my corpse to tell the tale. I thought I had lost my mind in the woods last night. Now I wish I had. <sighs> Consider this my send-off message. If you're driving through the backwoods near Huntsville and start smelling what I described in these pages, turn your vehicle around and drive the opposite direction. If you have any desire to live, don't come looking for me. I wouldn't want you to become food. All I ask is that you stay safe and watch out for this damn toxin.